If in 2003, you ask any rational human, who's going to make the smartphone, Microsoft or Apple? A rational human would have said Microsoft because it was far more you know, reasonable to believe that Microsoft would shrink the personal computer down into a small form factor than that Apple was going to upsize the iPod. Cool. Okay. So today I'm really happy to welcome on the show, Ian Rogers. Ian Rogers is CXO, Chief Experience Officer and Board Member at Ledger. And his kind of motto is is decentralizing what has been previously top down. Ledger is probably already very well known in industry, so it doesn't really need introduction, but is a global platform for digital assets and Web3. And it's the 10 year anniversary, which kind of, I guess, dates me and, and them a little bit. So we're going to be reflecting on what what's the same uh, as to their kind of core mission and, and what's their perspective on the market. Before we do that, uh, quickly, we would love you to do us a quick favor and subscribe to the show, add a comment, rate, like on whatever platform you're watching it on. Uh, in order that we can make sure that these reach as many people as possible. And so these important conversations around Web3 and its principles are shared far and wide. So without that, welcome onto the show, Ian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. So really excited for this conversation, actually. So of course, first to understand what has brought somebody like yourself into the space. You've got a huge range of experience across industries, all very exciting, interesting companies from LMBH to List, Apple Music, Beats, and now, of course, Ledger. As I said, it's Ledger's 10th year anniversary. And so we're going to be, I guess, reflecting on uh, Ledger's journeys and how you're looking at the future as we enter into the new bull run. And of course, the importance uh, around sovereignty and, and self custody. But I guess because of this background, a lot of creative industries, naturally, you are very interested in, in the world of NFTs. I know in particular, Gems of Art, you've just got back from NFT Paris. So it would be good to understand your kind of perspective on everything that happened there. But maybe before we go into all that, it would be great to kind of get your your journey, your story as to how and why you landed at, at Ledger and guess that the kind of previous roles that you've held. Sure. Yeah. And so thank you again for having me. So I, I grew up in Indiana and it was started with computers when I was a, a kid, like eight, nine, 10 years old. Long story short, I, I went to Indiana University and built the first search and stream system for the university. So there was a guy at the Indiana University Music Library that had this vision. This is in the early 90s that, you know, instead of vinyl behind the counter, it would be workstations throughout the library. And I was just at a work study job. So I was like, okay, you're paying me $6.25 an hour. I'll build whatever it is you want me to build. And what we built was a way to search the card catalog and find a multimedia record. And then you could stream that first from the IBM RS 6000 that was under my desk to the next workstation on top of my desk. And then, you know, you, you kind of, you know, ultimately we moved that to this brand new thing called the World Wide Web. So you could search the notice database, card catalog database, basically. And, and then for me, it was Groundhog Day for 20 years doing that digital music thing. I actually, you know, started in those early days of the web, building websites for things that I liked one of which was the Beastie Boys. So I actually dropped out of grad school in 1995 to go on tour with the Beastie Boys. And that's what took me to Los Angeles. But then on another Beastie Boys tour in 1998, I was posting MP3s from the soundboard. So I would record them from the soundboard and then get on the bus and convert them and the command line, because that's what you did. There wasn't like a a GUI for, you know, converting MP3s in those days. So I would, from the command line, take a take something out of a Sony, you know, DAT recorder and and then put it on on the web, but you couldn't you didn't just like put it up. You had to tell people how to do something with it because nobody even knew what an MP3 was in 1998. So I was linking to this website winamp.com and then someone I'd met in 1994 said, "Hey Ian, is that you on the other side of the Beastie Boys site because it's me on the other side of this Winamp site?" And um, through that I became the first employee at at what was Nullsoft who made Winamp which we sold to AOL in May of 99. Two of us from that company started a, another kind of a web-based Winamp that we sold to Yahoo in December of 2003. I, stayed, I built Yahoo's music subscription service, which you don't remember, but it launched in May of 2005. It's called Yahoo Music Unlimited. Um, ultimately took over Yahoo Music after Dave Goldberg left Yahoo and then you know, kind of went on from there. We had a company called Topspin, which was about, it was kind of like a band camp or a Patreon sort of thing. And then I was the CEO of Beats Music, built their music subscription service, sold that to Apple, built Apple Music. And then to me, that was, I mean, I honestly, like 
that was a career. You know, I started in digital musical science fiction and here we were, it was on every iPhone, you know, it took, it took more than 20 years, which I think is actually an, an interesting lesson because I think in, you know, we, you know, I was excited about digital music in 1993, in 1998, you know, we were, we felt like we were really on the cusp of it, but, you know, it wasn't until 2015 that, you know, it was really mainstream. And I think that that's a lesson that we have to carry with us into Web3. You know, I think the time from when you when you know these ideas are inevitable to the time when they come true is 12 to 15 years. So if you look at all the things that we believed in the bull run of 2021, I don't think they happen in this cycle. They are 2033 items. <laughs> They're not 2024 items. So, but then I, I, I had a call. I was, you know, I was just launching Apple Music at Apple and I had a call from LVMH, which I'd never heard of from Ben Arano, who I had at the time never heard of, you know, but I'm a quick study and I, I had Wikipedia. So I, I figured out, you know, that it was a, that it was an incredibly interesting phone call to come to Paris and be the chief digital officer of the world's largest conglomerate of, of luxury brands, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, but also great brands like Dior and Celine and, you know, wine and spirits brands. And they own Sephora and on and on and on. They were only about 3% e-commerce when I joined them in, in October of 2015. But then of course, if you fast forward to March, April of 2020, we were 100% e-commerce because all physical stores were closed. You know, so it was an incredible, incredible time to be with the company and, you know, really, really, really fun for me to take what I learned in music. Because I, I think what I learned in digital music wasn't just digital music. It was the way that the internet shapes culture, right? So we moved from these limited distribution channels to unlimited distribution channels, and that changes culture. So LVMH was this opportunity for me to see like, okay, well, these things I learned in music, do they apply elsewhere? Like, do they apply to culture more broadly? And of course, the answer was yes. And music is, is kind of interestingly the tip of the spear. You know, music has always been kind of the very first mover when it comes to internet technology. And I, I think I, had a, I was very lucky to, to be a part of a lot of that movement. And it teaches you something about the way that, that, that culture moves. And I was able to bring that to LVMH. Now, right when I moved to Paris, one of the first people I met was a guy named Pascal Gauthier. So this is 2015. He had this relatively new investment. He was the first investor and a board member at a company called Ledger, which did hardware to protect cryptocurrency. You know, I, I had known about Bitcoin since 2009. There was someone in my office at Topspin um, who was like, dude, you got to check this out. And I did a deep dive and was, and I thought, this threatens state sovereignty. And I had already lived through Napster and Nutella. And I was like, they're going to shut this down just like they did Napster and Nutella. Now, I, I knew that you couldn't stop the technology, but I, I thought just like Napster and Nutella, you can prevent companies from being built on copyright infringement, right? So that was the way I saw it was, this is an incredible invention, but I think it threatens state sovereignty and I don't think it lives. <laughs> but around, you know, 2014, I kind of saw, okay, wow, this is like, this is big enough that it's going to be difficult to stop. And so I invested in a small way. And then I met Pascal and in, in, when I moved to Paris and I got more bullish on, on crypto through my relationship with him. He had been orange pilled like many in Silicon Valley by Venceless and, you know, has, has and still to this day has super clear thoughts on, you know, on, on Bitcoin and, and, what it means, you know, the, the, what it, what it really means as a, as an invention and for us to have digital value in our digital lives. And, you know, I've been, you know, kind of looking hard at, at Bitcoin since then, I would say since 2015. And it's, to me, the amazing thing about it is it's, it's, it's one of the only things I've ever seen in my life that the longer you stare at it, the more beautiful it gets. But for me, I, you know, I was just friends with Pascal and we would hang out and, you know, go get drinks or go snowboarding or, or, you know, him skiing, me snowboarding, whatever. And, but it was around 2018 after ICO boom and bust that I called him and I said, Pascal, I think your company is going to be huge. Company being Ledger. And he was like, okay, I think so too. But why, what made you suddenly think so? And I said, because I remember the late nineties. And what I remember is you had this like dog fight between AOL and Microsoft and, you know, Microsoft's trying to kill Netscape and AOL's, there's a great book called World War 3.0 that, that chronicles this and, you know, it's an incredible history of the late nineties through the eyes of those companies. But what you had was you had Cisco kind of sitting on the side saying, we don't care who wins, we're good. 
right? And I realized that same thing, you know, during 2017, boom, I sold my cost basis in crypto because I'm like, this smells like dot-com madness to me. I don't have any idea what happens, but this feels unhealthy. And I just want to stop stressing about it. So I was like, I want to sell my cost basis and now I don't care. If it goes to zero, if it goes to 100, I don't care. Like emotionally, I have to remove myself emotionally from this madness. So in the in the aftermath of that, when you're sort of like able to see what's still real, that's when I got religion about Ledger. Because I realized if not self-custody, why crypto? But how are you going to do self-custody? Your phone's not going to do it. Not in the current incarnations that we have. I also realized that we're sort of lulled into thinking that our phones are really modern. But one thing you can be 100% sure of is that the phone you have in your pocket today is not the phone you'll have in your pocket five years from now, right? People like to talk about software versus hardware, but the reality is you've never used software without hardware. We misunderstand hardware and we forget how often we upgrade our hardware. And we forget that every revolution is actually led by hardware. You know, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when you didn't say go to my website or download my app. You said, there's this thing called the internet. And if you get a computer and you get a modem and you get an ISP and you get a web browser, then you can like download this colorless page really slowly. You know, I mean, people forget that that's where we started. So I was seeing that kind of that's where we are with crypto. And actually the only thesis that Cisco had in 1998 was, we think there will be more internet tomorrow than there was yesterday. And we think we're going to be an important part of that ecosystem. That was the you know big aha for me in 2018 for Ledger. There will be more digital ownership tomorrow than there was yesterday. And Ledger will be an important part of that ecosystem. So that was what I meant, Pascal. So from that point on, I became much more bullish. I didn't join the company until January of 21. I had a job to do at, at LVMH. I helped my friend Pascal in every way that I could because we're friends. And ultimately, you know, I said, you know what, I think it's time for me to, to come over. The market was raging and it was a time when I could come over. I was, I, you know, I also was at a point at LVMH where I had said when I walked in, this is a five-year, you know, thing for me. I actually said three to five years and I did a little more than five. So I either needed another, a new job inside of LVMH or a new job outside of LVMH and Ledger was there for me. So I came in and helped Pascal with the Series C and, you know, we've done a hell of a lot since. And like, we just, we're so much more prepared for this bull market than we were for, were for the one in 2021. And it's just incredibly exciting. It feels like, you know, we're going to actually get to unveil the work that we've been doing for the last three years in this market. So that's the backstory, how I ended up here and what we're doing. Yeah. Well, look, an ama amazing story. And, and it's great to hear learnings across the, the cycle of, well, even pre-web, right? But pre-web one, two, and now we're kind of entering into three. You know, I think music and streaming is always a go-to kind of reference point when you're kind of thinking about peer-to-peer -peer technology. And ultimately, you know, what happens beyond those early pioneers um, when things need to get built and the role that big techs primarily kind of played in that, I guess. Um, and then equally, uh, you know, if you're looking at um, even in AI now, like who's benefiting from the AI boom? Well, it's NVIDIA, right? It's chips and, and hardware. So I think there's definitely a lot, a lot to be said for that. I think given we've got you on and given your background, and I, we had a bit of a pre-chat previously where we were talking about this this concept of internet changing culture and our kind of shared love for, for David Bowie. To what extent, so beyond money, what is the role that culture and then NFTs can play in, in driving adoption? Do you think ultimately it is culture or money that will drive the kind of mass adoption of, of Web3 technology and, and the principles of, of digital ownership? Or, or do you think they're kind of one and the same thing? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think in, my point of view is what, the real invention that you have here is digital ownership, right? And so you have, you have this, um, this incredible invention, Bitcoin, which I think could easily be one of the most important inventions in the history of humanity. It's impossible to overstate that. And I just want to, I always want to encourage everyone to read Lynn Alden's Broken Money, which came out last year, because I think she does an incredible job of really breaking down the history of, of value and money and the modern monetary system, and then why Bitcoin is kind of the most perfect form of money that's ever been created, and why that's relevant and valuable, right? So I think that's important. And, and so before we talk about culture, I just, I think it's important and worth saying, and I, I just don't have any doubt that 
any thoughtful person who makes their way through broken money won't leave it unchanged, right? And and kind of realizing that Bitcoin really is unique. It's not just magic speculative money. It's actually incredibly interesting. And, and as I think Hal Finney says in a quote in the book, it exists in this like very narrow design space where you know anything you do to try to improve it actually makes it worse. They're they're very so I think also as an engineer, there's kind of that you know something having been designed in that narrow design space is is just incredibly interesting. But what you have broadly is this concept of of digital ownership. And you know, for me, that itself is profound, and it's such a missing link in many of the things we were trying to do and the vision that we had for the internet in the early days. You know, in, in 2001, Rob Lord and I started a company called Media Code, and our goal was to build a loosely coupled media value chain. Because what we saw was we saw Napster was like the consumer end of the value chain, trying to own the entire value chain, and then the record label's response to that was like, "No, we're the record labels, and we're going to own the whole value chain." And we were like, "No, no, it's a value chain." Like it's not one person owning it. It has to be loosely coupled so that we can have a free market. And if I'm a creative person, there are steps between me and you know the the and the consumer. And those you know whether it's a distributor or a retailer or a record label or there there are many you know players in this value chain. But you know we, what we need is technology that helps us make those connections. And it, it didn't really materialize that way. You know, we've ended up with, you know, I'm just using music as the example because it's what I know and I think it's simple and easy to understand. But I do think the analogy um, carries through to so many other things where we we had this dream of something that was loosely coupled, but what we ended up with is oligopolies on either side. We went over that time from five record labels to three record labels. And, you know, now, I mean, you used to go to these digital music meetups in San Francisco in the early 2000s, and there'd be 150 companies there. Most of them are out of business. And now you've got Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and Amazon, right? It's not very exciting in terms of innovation. You know, you and I aren't going to go start the new SoundCloud tomorrow. SoundCloud isn't even SoundCloud anymore, right? Today is Bandcamp Friday, though. I will be, you know, participating in supporting artists directly in that way. So I still have the ethos, but I think it's, you know, again, it's not quite what we asked for. And to me, in a lot lot of ways, the missing ingredient is digital ownership. So let's use Bandcamp as an example. You know, every Bandcamp page is the same. I can stream the music for free. I can buy the digital album for $10. I can buy the compact disc for 15 bucks. I can buy the vinyl for $30. You know, what if you added you know, a digital collectible to that page. You know, what would be the, the ratio? Some people would buy vinyl, some people would buy the digital collectible. And I promise you that over the next 10 years, that mix would change in favor of the digital collectible because, you know, there, there's the reason that someone would buy a digital collectible really rivals the reason that you buy vinyl. You know, a lot of people buy vinyl and never play it. They buy it to support the artist. They buy it for the aesthetics. They buy it, you know, for the collectorness. And I, I think that digital ownership is, you know, truly profound and fits into our lives in, in a whole bunch of ways. Let me give you another example. One of the, you know, hottest products at CES this year that everybody was talking about was the Rabbit R1, right? The little AI device, you talk to it. Now, I was thinking about that as like a engineering problem. One of the examples they use, it's going to buy you a plane ticket. I call bullshit, right? I know, you know how hard it is to buy a, we- a plane ticket in Web2, right? Buy me a ticket to Miami. Okay, really? Like, you know, Siri can like barely take a note, right? You know, it's going to, this thing is going to like have my, all my preferences across multiple airlines. It's going to have to have my logins. That doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even have my money, right? Now, approach that same problem from the basis of digital ownership, where my private key literally unlocks everything that you need to do that task. It has access to my wallet. It has access to my preferences because my preferences, instead of being stored across thousands of sites on the Web2 internet, they're owned by me and my preferences live with me in my wallet. My memberships, if you want to call them that, you know, my, my Air France, my Delta, et cetera, all of those things are, are digital objects that I own. Right. That the basis of digital ownership is so much easier to solve that that rabbit R1 problem than from the Web2 Internet. So I, I think it's that fundamental. I think digital art in some ways is to digital ownership what digital music was to, to kind of digital information. And what I mean by that is I, I really contextualize the Internet revolution as a revolution of information. You know, information used to be behind gatekeepers and, you know, I had to like turn on the radio or turn on the television or go to the local 
Hallmark store and buy a magazine. You know, that was where the information was gated. And then it was simply anybody buys a URL, right? So the internet was fundamentally a revolution of information. And what we have in, you know, in, in the world of blockchain is a revolution of value and ownership. And I think that, you know, digital art, it's like music was. Why did music, why was music the tip of the spear? It was kind of easy. Songs are short. It's not that much data. It's pretty easy to render. I don't need like, you know, a, bit, a high frame rate. It's like an easy database problem, you know, artist, album, track, genre, you know, like, so everybody who's like 21 years old loves music, you know, it's like, and that's where the coders were, you know, so I think digital art is that same thing. It's really simple. It's ownership. I'm a creator. I can let you own something I created. You're a collector. You can collect something I created. It's no more, you know, di it's no different than that. And what, but what it will lead to is solutions for these more complex problems, I also think it's, um, you know, in that Bandcamp example I gave, I think is the way things will evolve. We'll start with your user account on drmartins.com, amazon.com will become a wallet. And then ultimately you'll move to a, to a self-custody wallet. Um, I think all this stuff in between is noise, frankly. But this is what, you know, will happen over time is that digital ownership will become normal. I think that Instagram jumped the gun a bit, but they had exactly the right idea. Um, you know, the moment that Rihanna posts a photo on Instagram and says, okay, it's $5 each, there's 500 of them. And when they're all sold, I'm taking the photo down. You have an entirely new group of, you know, collectors who have, who have ownership. So I do think that these things move the needle. I think that they, they take a lot more time than we thought. Like I said earlier, I think that these ideas that we thought were coming tomorrow in 2021, I think they come in 2033. Just that's what time has taught me. Just like all the ideas that we had in 1998 and 99 came true in 2012. But I think that, you know, they do come true and they all move together. I think what we're seeing in the current market, though, is that a world of value is different from a world of information. I mean, look what's happened. You know, we had $64,000 Bitcoin this week. That was driven by institutions. You know, retail basically missed out on the move from 40000 to 64000 and And I think the institutions wanted it that way. I think that you have a, a really a different game with much higher stakes uh, in the world of digital value. But I think all things move toward digital ownership in our digital lives. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you touched on lots of interesting points there, if I kind of focus on a couple of them. So looking at that end game, as, as we understand that we begin to possess sovereignty, digital sovereignty of our, how we might express ourselves, our information, our data, and then the ability to unlock that. I think the convergence of AI and blockchain is, is really interesting. And I kind of had the same response when I saw the rabbit thing. It's like, how do you solve that centrally? You know, how, how can it know enough about you that it can solve these tasks in a highly personalized way? And even if it could, like, why would you want one platform to know that much about you, right? Given what we know about platforms as a whole. And when you turn that around and put that on a basis of digital ownership, to me, like, a, I, that's why it's like I said, a light bulb went off. I was like, wow. Okay. If I own, my value and, and my, not my value means not just my my monetary value and not just my JPEGs, right? I own my identity the same way. I mean, by the way, identity is access already, right? During COVID, I had more mobility than most people because I had a U.S. passport and a French work visa. So unlike my French friends or my American friends, I can move between the two countries, right? Why? Because I owned that identification, right? You know, how can I get into that party? at NFT Paris? Well, because I've got the token, you know, ownership, ownership equals access. And so when you pair that with a tool like the, the R1, to me, you know, that that's where things go. And I think that that's, there is something profound in that. You know, I always say that in, if in 2003, you ask any rational human, who's going to make the smartphone, Microsoft or Apple, a rational human would have said Microsoft because it was far more, you know, reasonable to believe that Microsoft would shrink the personal computer down into a small form factor than that Apple was going to upsize the iPod, you know, in, into this thing that is in our lives, right? I think it could be a similar thing here that actually we start from a basis of Web3 as opposed to a basis of Web2. And that seems a, a bit irrational, but, you know, if you grow kind of from where Ledger is into the R1, as opposed to growing from, you know, say where Facebook is, you know, into that reality, it makes, it makes you know, far more sense actually. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess you're, 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 you're building from the principles of the new paradigm, right? Exactly. Bit by bit from the principles of the new paradigm. Exactly.
And, and presumably that's what then feeds into your kind of timing or time frame of this and when you see it mainstream because these various bits need to get built. Now, obviously, there's a huge amount of innovation that's happened in you know this, this bear market. But I, I want to kind of come to this value capture piece because I, I think it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, again, you talked about in the context of, of music and streaming. But do you think if we look at the value chain that is – digital ownership and Web3, how do you think that's going to play out? Do you think it's going to be different now because Web3 has composability, so it it naturally challenges people trying to build moats? Presumably, you see a piece of hardware like Ledger is, is, again, critical to allowing a user to opt out of a particular platform, to transferability, portability, this kind of stuff. So, do, do you have a, a kind of thesis on how you think that's going to play out? Do you th- or do you think that look ultimately, like in any information technology revolution, you know, there's this kind of bundling and unbundling, centralization, decentralization? Yeah, I, I think I'm too old to be naive on this at this point. You know, when I when I saw the internet, immediately what I thought was like this is going to level the playing field and take away the gatekeepers. And like I said, that's not what we got. We got an oligopoly. So. I don't think we should be naive about that. I think that what you have is you have an ecosystem that more people can participate in and you hear success stories in that. But and I do think that, you know, crypto largely will amount to a, you know, redistribution of wealth, but I don't kid myself into thinking that will be egalitarian. I think that there is sort of and, and, and you know there is a quality of access because you know we can all kind of do our own research and and get that information but you know but I, I mean look at even what just happens with airdrops right it's like it's people who complain about the inflation of of you know the, the the inflation of fiat money creating their own money and giving it to their friends right okay you know absolute power corrupts absolutely I think that that's there's something human in that I think though that what we do have is this option of ownership but I say option because look at it look at where we are right now as humanity we have eight billion people. We have 5.3 billion people on the internet. We have 5 billion people on social media. We've got roughly 2.3 billion people playing video games. We have only about 500 million people in the world of crypto, and probably only 10 million of them actually have secure you know, custody of their private keys. We've sold 6.5 million ledger devices. And we're the by far the the leading you know hardware wallet. You know, you've got maybe 30 million monthlies on MetaMask, and you know, you can you can so you can say there's maybe self-custody in 30 to 50 million people total out of that 500 million, most of them aren't secure. And so you realize that, and, and let, let's say like even of, of the people who have um, self-custody and hardware wallets, how many of them have good operational security, right? How many of them are not going to call, you know, our customer care tomorrow and say, oh, I lost my device and my recovery phrase. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're really getting down into small numbers. So that's why I say we have the option of self-custody. But I mean, even look at pass keys, you know, you've got, you know, what, what do we do with pass keys? Like we give, you know, we give our private keys to Google and iCloud, you know, I mean, so I, I think that there is a, to me, this is something we should really, really care a lot about because we now have this, this option for self-custody and it's up to us collectively, you know, to say how, what we do with that, what we do with that ownership. So I, I you know, I, I really look at it as like, what's the fundamental you know, the fundamental with the internet was kind of TCP IP and standards like HTTP and, and FTP and the ability to move bits effortlessly. You know, distribution became trivial thanks to the internet. So what is it with the world of blockchain? Well, it's, it's ownership, you know, so we can have ownership. Um, and the question is, you know, and we can have decentralized ownership. You know, we have this layer of abstraction, in other words, that we didn't have before. And so then the question is, you know, what do we do with that and where is it important? And also, I think that we get a little kind of overzealous with it as well, because, you know, is it important that my gym membership is decentralized? Not really. You know, I'm not even sure it's important that my passport is decentralized, right? I mean, the government can revoke your passport. It's not, you know, it's not decentralized ownership. But when it comes to things like property rights and speech, you know, that is where decentralization is key. You mentioned my bio, which says, de- you know, decentralizing that which was previously top down. I actually put that on my LinkedIn page around 2000 or 2001. And <laughs> it's been there. I didn't realize how, how important it was to me, to be honest with you. I kind of put it there, you know, flippantly and it's lived there ever since. I really think that, you know, self-custody is important. You know, I, I do think that at the same time, the future is heterogeneous, right? Like look in, look in, in your life and you have a combination 
of custody and self custody. You've got a bunch of different keys on your key ring. You know, when you're in my wallet, I have cash, I have, you know, subway tickets, I have an ATM card with a low limit, I have a credit card with a high limit, I have a driver's license, you know, uh, like a, a work permit, you know, like these, these things. And they have kind of different levels of decentralization and custody in a way and, and also utility, you know, like, you know, a credit card is anything but decentralized, but the utility is incredible, actually. You know, I can go anywhere in the world and just, you know, touch this thing to a terminal and buy whatever I need to buy. Like, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it really is an incredible invention. You know, but I think at, at the end of the day, especially when it comes to things like our identities, you know, the fact that the majority of humans on the planet can be, you know, deplatformed either because someone doesn't like what it is you're saying or simply because some hacker can, you know, steal your iCloud and you'll never get it back. And that is, you know, not only the way you communicate, but, but you know, potentially the last 10 years of your photos, you know, that's the kind of fragility I think we can't live with, right? And where self-custody is incredibly important. And this isn't just about your private keys, you know, for your Bitcoin, this is, you know, for me, you know, my ledger is my 2FA on my Twitter, right? It is my 2FA on my login.gov account. You know, for me, I will not put my pass keys with iCloud or Google. I will put them with my ledger because that is me having ownership of my identity and not only my digital, my Bitcoin, my ETH, my Solana, my generative art, but literally my ability to, you know, to, to log into a platform where I, you know, where I, where I need to have have access. So this is I think it's um it's important on this level. Right. So maybe if we, we zoom out and you know there's many other pathways I could take to talk with you on this like really fascinating chat. But if we zoom out and we come back to that inflection point for you where you felt that Bitcoin, maybe crypto more generally, it had significant enough I guess network hardening or distribution or whatever it was that it had gone past the point at which it could be sufficiently censored you know how do you see effectively this battle between state sovereignty and user sovereignty play out i mean i feel like that question is above my pay grade i'm just a skateboarder from indiana you know i love the topic like i said i mean what i would point people to is broken money you know the book the, the quest which is about it's not about crypto at all it's about energy uh, and the history of energy on the planet. I point people to a book by a guy who hates Bitcoin, which is called The End of the World is Just the Beginning. I think I think all of these things sort of offer clues as to why we're in a completely unique place as humanity. Um, we've never had such a long period of peace. We've never had countries that are so intertwined with one another, yet our kind of international distribution networks are very fragile, which we all learned during COVID. You could see, you know, you could see very clearly. And also we have, you know, unprecedented you know, debt. You have a, a scenario where Jerome Powell is on 60 Minutes saying that, you know, the kind of the fiscal policy is not tenable, you know, for the long term, which and I think all of these are, are like truly unprecedented things. And you also have the first truly scarce asset ever listed on the US stock exchange with, you know, truly record you know, they're, they're doing doing things that, you know, ETFs have never been known to do, like truly unprecedented. You know, these are unprecedented times and we have an unprecedented asset and you have unprecedented things going on. Again, what I would encourage people to do is to, is to you know, is to read these. And again, do your own research is the mantra. You know, I think if you, to me, if you, if you've kind of studied these things, you know, to have zero exposure to Bitcoin is, you know, total craziness. I mean, time will tell, but certainly, you know, having zero exposure is, is, uh, is high risk relative to having, you know, even one or 2% exposure. I think, you know, for me, what there, there, you could imagine other ways that the scenario played out. You know, you could imagine, you know, Bitcoin just sort of being illegal, you know, in places like America and America going after doing what China did and creating, you know, their own digital currency or doing, you know, what India did in, in creating kind of a, a currency that, that everybody uses in the country. And then, you know, maybe you don't have access to, or you don't even have a reason, you know, to use something else in it. And it, it really stays kind of black market. You can imagine that happening. But at this point, a scenario where stable coins, you know, or digital dollars, probably a better word, um, uh, you know, are become regulated and they actually um, bolster the dollar as um, the world reserve currency, right? Because now you have, you have this product that we already see people in places like Argentina want, 
which is, you know, a, a digital currency that's backed by the US dollar. You know, if you hold pesos, you'd rather have dollars. If you have dollars, you'd rather have Bitcoin. You know, that's kind of where we are on the planet at the moment. I, I've been, you know, turning my dollars and my euros into Bitcoin all through the bear market with, you know, and and my financial advisor in Los Angeles kind of looking at me sideways, like, are you she and are you sure, Ian, are you sure? And he texted me on Wednesday and he said, wow, you really did have a crystal ball. And I was like, no, I didn't. I'm just paying attention. You know, again, if you have pesos, you'd rather have dollars. If you have dollars, you'd rather have Bitcoin. Like, I have never seen anything so obvious. I think that that's just kind of where we are. And I think that the, you know, who knows what happens, you know, because, but if the future looks like the past, we do have some idea, right? So to me, that's, you know, it's all, it's all about the fundamentals. And like I said, you know, these fundamental things, you know, that I started to believe in 2015, I've only, my conviction has only grown. It hasn't waned anywhere along the way. Well, look, Ian, I think that's a great place to close off. I think understanding what we can borrow from the past to understand the future, and then also, of course, the importance of self-custody and, and the role that Ledger plays in that. So thanks very much for coming on, Ian. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. 